another Q&A time. If you want to ask me a question, then follow me on Instagram at Seamland. All right, first question. Can longevity protocols be achieved without popping any pills? Let's say you, the answer is obviously like, yes, you don't need to take any pills to have a solid longevity routine, especially if you're young or in your middle ages. Uh, maybe in your later years, it still uh, would give you like a net positive to have some of the you know, pharmaceuticals, especially with uh, the coming advancements in some of the longevity drugs that we will have in the next few decades or so. So right now, we don't, just don't have any supplement or pill that is as strong as a healthy lifestyle and as strong as regular physical exercise and a good diet. Just none of those supplements really work as well. But uh, in the next coming decades, I would presume that we will have you know, some, at least a few of these longevity molecules that uh, might move the needle in a much more profound uh, way. You know, but do you need to do it? This obviously depends a lot on many other factors. No, you don't need to do it. You will probably achieve like 90% of your longevity potential with just diet and exercise and general lifestyle, in my opinion. Even some of the more, let's say, more evidence-based uh, supplements, even like, you know, fish oil or glynac or, uh, you know, even like rapamycin or so, those kind of things, you probably won't see any more than like 5% of uh, benefit or 5% of the actual results when it comes to longevity there's there's just not they're not just uh, that powerful enough and uh, maybe in the few decades we will have like a more stronger stronger molecules but uh, as as of now they're just not good enough to have like a profound effect and uh, again even then if you do have some sort of a breakthrough molecule i would guess it's not going to be any stronger than you know 10 percent of uh, the actual results 90% of the actual results will still come from a regular exercise routine, good like just a lifestyle, not uh, smoking, not drinking too much alcohol, not being uh, stressed out. All those things are much more important than any supplements. If you are already doing all the lifestyle things well and you want to add an additional 5% or an additional 3% even, you know, because the supplements themselves still are just, you want to add 1% or 1 to 2, 1, 2, 3% more. Uh, to your already well-rounded healthy lifestyle. So they're never going to replace the healthy lifestyle. They'll always add only like one, two, three percent. And uh, maybe in the next few decades, we'll have some of them that add five, ten percent or something like that. Disappointed! With that being said, I think there are still some like, even now there are some uh, supplements that could have a pretty beneficial effect for the elderly in terms of increasing health span. So maintaining better health for longer and in so doing slowing down the age related decline and some other age related conditions so like a good list of them would be glycine and nac because it actually has been shown to reverse hallmarks of aging in humans and other functional declines in humans like muscle strength and cognition those things you can maintain that at least based on some um, randomized clinical trials that in elderly people glynac uh, helps to reverse that and uh, maybe like creatine as well like creatine is just going to again maintain muscle strength and walking speed or uh, cognition even it's going to help with those uh, functional outcomes and maybe like you know with age you see a drop in melatonin so your melatonin levels go down your deep sleep your REM sleep go down your total sleep quality and total sleep duration go down with age so maybe is replacing that uh, or filling the gap with your natural melatonin production with uh, some melatonin supplementation could also be like a anti-aging strategy that's yet to be proven but um, there's no there's little to no downside uh, to uh, doing that, in my opinion, especially in the elderly people who see a decline in those uh, parameters, like they see a decline in melatonin production, they see a decline in sleep quality, sleep duration, and glutathione levels, antioxidant defense, all those things go down. So, you know, at that stage, some of the supplements could help to fill the gap to a certain extent, but they're not going to like replace again the healthy lifestyle. Quitting bad habits can be hard, especially if you do it cold turkey. That's why most people end up rebounding with their bad habits. The sponsor of this video, Fume, looks at the problem differently. Not everything in a bad habit is wrong. So instead of a drastic, uncomfortable change, why not just remove the bad from your habit? Fume is an innovative, award-winning flavored air device that does just that. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. 
and instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses all natural delicious flavors. You basically insert the 100% plant-based cores with different flavors, such as lemon, grapefruit, mint or vanilla into the fume and you just get flavored air that smells and tastes great. It doesn't pollute the room or leave nasty smells. I personally find the fume very helpful for helping some of my family members break bad habits. It's easy to use, 100% natural with no chemicals or bad ingredients and it helps with de-stressing while trying to break the habit. Head over to tryfum.com forge the seam or scan the QR code and use the code seam to get a 10% off on your order today. And a quick little longevity hack, I got a dog <laughs> with my wife, this is a small multi-poo puppy, he's three months old right now, his name is Apollo, and uh, you know, log dogs are also, actually dog ownership is linked to longevity. I didn't get the dog because of the study that I saw that the dog ownership is linked to 24% reduced mortality, but uh, it still, you know, gives a few longevity bites. See hello Apollo. Hey, hey, hey. Next question. For a skinny fat guy, 18% body fat, is it better to bulk than cut, cut than bulk or body recomposition? State of being skinny fat pretty much uh, refers to having low muscle tone and still like like a visceral fat accumulation with a small belly or just having, you know, even subcutaneous, excess subcutaneous fat also be, can be categorized here. You know, uh, you can use a DEXA scan to uh, measure your uh, lean appendicular mess and uh, you're gonna have like actual numbers to know if you are skinny fat but if you just have skinny arms and a big belly then that's pretty much skinny fat so what do you do in this situation should you bulk and try to gain muscle or you should you cut and try to lose the fat first i think if you're skinny fat then you probably are very you know new to training or you're just desensitized to the training so you're probably not doing any training right now so just starting to lift weights will already do the recomposition so you will already build muscle and lose fat at the same time if you start from a skinny fat position pretty much because you're going to be sensitive to the stimulus and you're going to see results very fast so just even if you didn't change anything like you still eat the same diet you do everything else same but you start lifting weights you will see a positive body recomposition just automatically like that now the way to optimize it further or if you are already more advanced with training or if you're doing training then the second most important part is to just eat more protein so you could replace uh, your fat intake and carbohydrate intake with some increased protein so you could even eat like 40 percent of your calories coming from protein and that is also going to help with the body recomposition this strategy of like a very high protein and lo lower carb lower fat diet this will also work in terms of recomposition for more like advanced trainees so if you're already like semi shredded or um, not shredded but you know a little bit of extra fat but you already have a solid foundation for muscle mass, you can already see a positive change in your body recomposition as well by eating this high protein, lower carb, lower fat diet. And uh, this is one of the strategies that obviously bodybuilders use as well during contest prep to maintain as much muscle, muscle tissue as possible while losing body fat as well. They eat high protein, low carb, low fat. But uh, if you're a beginner and you're like just untrained, then just start lifting weights and try to focus on more the strength side. So, um, you know, not power lifting per se, but, you know, trying to aim for around six to 12 repetitions and uh, three to four sets. And in total, it's gonna be pretty effective and a great way to build strength and muscle at the same time while losing fat, especially if you're like a beginner. Next question, how can I lower my triglycerides? So triglycerides, fatty acids in the bloodstream the biggest thing that actually raises triglycerides is carbohydrate intake and reducing carbohydrate intake is the most effective way to lower your triglycerides as well. So the reason why triglycerides rise when you're eating carbohydrates has to do with the fact that when your body is you know, burning carbohydrates for fuel, then it's not burning fat for fuel. So your body can't really burn all the fuel sources at once. It can not burn all carbs and all fats at the same time except if you're in a calorie deficit or except when you're exercising very hard so if you have a very high energy demand then your body will burn everything but if you're you know, a regular person or if you're sedentary then eating carbohydrates reduces the the fat burning and as a result of that more triglycerides stay in the blood for longer so a lower low carb diet is the best and fastest way to lower uh, triglycerides you can still achieve a low triglyceride level on a high carb diet 
So my triglyceride levels are around 30 milligrams per deciliter, which is the um, optimal range. It's like pretty much the lowest. Uh, there, there is kind of um, achievable almost below 30 grams is pretty hard, but uh, you want to be at least below 60 milligrams per deciliter with your triglycerides for optimal longevity. But I still eat a high carb diet. So how do I achieve that? I just eat less fat. <laughs> so if you're eating higher carb, but your fat is low, then you're going to have by default less triglycerides in the blood because you're consuming less fat and you're consuming less triglycerides. So as a result of that, your body will still have lower blood triglyceride levels if you eat uh, lower fat. So a high carb, low fat diet or a low carb, high fat diet is the way to achieve lower triglyceride, triglycerides. And obviously exercise helps with that, weight loss helps with that, uh, you know, making sure that you're not drinking alcohol. If you have too much uh, alcohol intake, then that can raise triglycerides. So, uh, you know, it's kind of two levers that I always follow low carb, high fat or high carb, low fat. You don't want to be eating high carb, high fat because that's going to keep your blood sugar as well as triglycerides levels uh, elevated, which is a recipe for metabolic syndrome and other health problems. So you, you need to always kind of choose either low carb, high fat or high carb, low fat, in my opinion. Protein should be still relatively the same on a moderate to higher end. Lower protein is not the best, but uh, moderate to higher end is going to be kind of the stable protein intake and then you adjust the carbs and fats accordingly next question how do you track your sleep so i use different sleep trackers you know i've used the aura ring i've used the whoop band i also have the eight sleep mattress so i have pretty much i can choose whichever uh, sleep tracker i use there are some things that are similar across these sleep trackers for example my heart rate and hrv are consistent across all three sleep trackers so it's the same on Aura, it's the same on Whoop, it's the same on the uh, Eight Sleep. When it comes to sleep, uh, let's say scores, then there are some discrepancies. I always get like 100 on my Eight Sleep <laughs> and uh, I get with uh, Whoop and Aura, I might get like something between 80 to 90 uh, usually. And the biggest reason probably has to do with the fact that I don't sleep solid eight hours. Like I usually sleep around seven to eight hours, so I never or rarely do I actually reach the full eight hours, uh, but sometimes I do. So the discrepancies aren't like that big of a concern. I don't really think you should like be so like neurotic or very focused about the sleep scores. For example, it's good to know that, okay, I'm getting at least two hours of deep sleep. And I, and I always get two hours of deep sleep on all the sleep trackers, whichever I use. And I always get like one and a half to two hours of REM sleep on all the sleep trackers so the sleep scores themselves are subjective because the companies use different algorithms to calculate the sleep score whether you get 95 or 76 whatever that's based on just the algorithm that they choose uh, but the amount of deep sleep and REM sleep is what matters more so how many hours of deep and REM sleep are you getting that's uh, that's pretty consistent across all the sleep trackers and how many times I wake up and how, much, how long does it take me to fall asleep? That's also pretty consistent across all the sleep trackers. So yeah, the scores themselves don't matter. What matters more is like how much deep sleep and REM sleep are you getting? And you can use pretty much any sleep tracker to, uh, to gauge that. Next question, does VO2 max built on a bike also increase VO2 max while running? Uh, yes. <laughs> so, you know, your VO2 max is just a reflection of your cardiorespiratory fitness. How fit are you? How well is your body able to utilize oxygen and it doesn't matter if you you know have a high vo2 max from training swimming or running or cycling if you're a very good swimmer you probably have a high vo2 max even while you're running it's just that the sports specific specificity also matters in uh, you know how fast you actually run <laughs> so if you're only swimming and you're never running then you're going to get very good at swimming and you, you're running like your running form and your running performance those things are going to be less optimal because you haven't practiced that much and, and vice versa if you're always running and you're never swimming then you know your running form can be good but your swimming performance might be more suboptimal so if you want to actually run very fast like you want to have a very good 5k time or a very fast marathon time then you need to actually train and you need to train the running having a good cardiorespiratory fitness obviously helps a lot like even the most consistent runner if they have a vo2 max of like 50 compared to like an olympic swimmer who has a vo2 max of 
75 or 80, then it will probably still outrun the guy who has the VO2 max of 50. Uh, maybe maybe in some except rare cases it's not the case, but in most cases the, the guy with a significantly higher VO2 max will outperform the one who has a lower VO2 max. But uh, if the differences are small, so like if the difference is only like 5 points, so if the guy has 50 and the other guy has 55, then the difference probably isn't that big, and the guy who actually practices running more is going to outperform the guy who doesn't run that much, if you get what I mean. So sport specificity matters, what endurance sport, what type of cardio, cardio do you want to be good at, <laughs> but uh, that matters, but uh, the overall just putting in the hours of increasing your cardiovascular fitness is what matter, matters uh, most. If you're, if you're actually measuring your uh, VO2 max at the VO2 max lab, then uh, they have told that um, if you're doing the bike, so you can do the VO2 max test on, on the bike, you can do it on the treadmill, you can do it on the step climber, doesn't matter which type it is, uh, but they do tell that uh, your VO2 max is going to be around 10% lower when you're doing the bike. So if you're measuring your VO2 max with the bike, you're expected to get around 10% lower score compared to running. I'm not sure exactly why that is, but that's what they told me uh, several times. So uh, yeah, I, I usually measure my VO2 max with the just a treadmill running test. And uh, that's the way I also train my cardio and uh, VO2 max because I want to get I want to get good at running. Like uh, I like running and I think it's pretty functional as well. Of course, if you do too much running or if you have poor form, you're going to hurt your knees. If you can't run, a good alternative is to do cycle. You're going to still increase your uh, VO2 max. Or if you can't cycle even, then swimming is also a very good way to increase the VO2 max. Next question, how important is counting calories or you can skip it and just eat the right foods? Well, obviously you don't need to count calories at all. I don't count calories. I don't like measure them. I don't think about them even. I just eat the same foods every day and on some days I eat a bit more, especially if I've lifted weights or if I've exercised a lot, then I just eat more calories or eat more food and on the days that I'm sedentary or if I'm just not hungry enough, then I eat less and I adjust my energy intake based on how I look in the mirror. So if I see, okay, I'm starting to gain a little bit of fat, then I just eat less or exercise more and uh, if I'm starting to get too skinny or if I'm starting to get too lean or if my gym performance is just plateaued, I'm just so tired all the time, I don't have the strength to actually train or if my strength numbers are going down then that's probably a sign of them in a calorie deficit and uh, I would need to be eating more if I want to regain that strength so I just adjust it based on what I'm doing and how I perform and how I look if that makes sense I do think it's very valuable to measure and weigh all the foods and measure all the calories at least a few weeks just to get a baseline understanding of how many calories your body requires and how many calories affect your body composition because 99% of people have no idea <laughs> about those things. They have no idea how many calories a glass of milk has. They have no idea of how many calories a piece of salmon has or even vegetables or broccoli or whatever it is. They don't have any idea about how many calories certain foods have. But it is a very powerful superpower, in my opinion, to know, okay, I know approximately, you know, 100 grams of oats, dried oats has around like 350 calories. I know that because I've measured that in the past or I've just looked it up in the past or one banana usually has like 80 to 100 calories. That's a pretty good information to know. One glass of milk has around, again, 80 to 100 calories. So it's one of those things that will certainly improve your nutritional understanding. And uh, if you have that knowledge, then you will also be able to make somewhat better uh, decisions in your food choices and especially how much food you need to eat you don't need to be neurotic about it you don't need to be like obsessively calculating calories um, but uh, it will certainly make it easy uh, or it will certainly systemize it if you actually count all the calories and if you stick to your uh, allocated calorie intake then you will pretty much lose weight like you're guaranteed to lose weight if you're calculating and weighing all the foods and you're in a calorie deficit and uh, you follow all the things that you're supposed to eat and uh, following a meal plan, then you're guaranteed to lose weight. It's just most people aren't willing to do that and uh, they're not, you know, they don't have this self-control or discipline to actually follow a meal plan. But if you were to follow a meal plan and you are in a calorie deficit, then yes, you will pretty much lose weight. That's pretty much guaranteed. Next question, are you working on another book? If so, what is the topic? Yes, I am writing my next book. 
it's uh, called the longevity leap and it's talking about the most evidence-based uh, current understanding of aging and increasing health span and trying to extend lifespan as well so the idea is that you know you have your maximum lifespan which is the day or the, how long you live and then you have your health span which is how long you're healthy most people have a shorter health span than their maximum lifespan they start to experience this decline in health span already like 10 to 20 years before they die so the idea is that if you postpone the decline in your health span you're gonna stay healthier for longer you'll enjoy life more and theoretically there's nothing else or there's nothing um, that would say that you wouldn't extend your lifespan as well if you extend your health span all the things that increase your health span also have a positive effect on increasing your lifespan and longevity so the book is about okay what is all the information about diet exercise supplements sleep and uh, different uh, chronic diseases age related decline biological aging all those things put together into like into this uh, into this book that will just teach you the main main principles of that and uh, it is going to come out maybe right now i'm still in the process of writing it's pretty long it takes a long time so i'm expected i'm expecting to uh, publish uh, the book in february 2024 if all things go well and you can sign up for the updates at the longevity leap uh, .com. next question somebody asked about training and melatonin i got interested what's the benefit i'm not exactly sure there was one question about do you take melatonin on training days uh, I do take it sometimes, so uh, there's nothing that would indicate that melatonin would suppress the beneficial adaptations of uh, exercise and that it would reduce your muscle growth or VO2 max or anything like that. Whereas some antioxidants like vitamin C or NAC or berberine or metformin, uh, they uh, do have a negative effect on exercise adaptations, so you don't want to take them after exercise. But I haven't seen anything that would indicate that melatonin would do something like that. So it's safe to take on training days as well. And even even then it actually might help with recovery. Especially if you're like someone who might get overstimulated by exercising hard. So some people uh, experience that. So they might lose some sleep. So uh, melatonin can you know theoretically help to counteract that or help to like fall asleep. But there's nothing that would like inhibit the exercise adaptations because you're already taking melatonin in the evening as well maybe if you were to take melatonin during the day immediately after lifting weights then that would be a problem for uh the, because of the antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effects but i haven't seen anything else uh, in regards to melatonin inhibiting exercise adaptation you know there are some theories as well that melatonin could reduce testosterone levels and in so doing then have negative effect on muscle growth but uh, the studies actually find that uh, melatonin supplementation in young, healthy adults isn't associated with lower testosterone. So yeah, it's not going to lower your testosterone uh, levels uh, either. Next question, is there any point combining Tongat Ali and Turkesterone or better to just take one? So I think Tongat Ali probably has testosterone boosting effects in people with lower or moderate testosterone if your testosterone is already high then you probably don't see like additional <laughs> testosterone boost uh, from that because your testosterone is already pretty high with turkesterone the studies are also a bit conflicting or confusing on one hand you have a lot of people online saying that it works great i have used uh, turkesterone myself and i do notice that i'm stronger with it and uh, it helps with uh, lifting weights especially strength based and maybe some muscle growth as well but at, at least based on the studies it shouldn't work <laughs> but my own personal experience says it does and other people online say so as well so i guess you have to like you know just try it out yourself and see if it works maybe it's placebo who knows uh i wouldn't like spend a lot of money on turkesterone or, tron or tonkarali as well unless you have some lower testosterone and you're trying to like increase it naturally without taking any trt or something like that i have taken tongarali as well i haven't noticed any difference from that uh so yeah i'm not taking tongarali regularly and uh, I'm, I'm taking turkesterone every once in a while should you combine it i mean they work differently tongarali doesn't necessarily increase 
like muscle strength unless it actually increases your testosterone then you might see an increase in your strength as well but they work differently like uh turkesterone isn't a testosterone booster and tongalali isn't like a isn't a ectosterone ectosterone it's not going to enhance muscle growth necessarily you know you could combine them but at the same time they're both pretty expensive and uh, the evidence about them is also not that you know clear so you know so you have i guess you have to try it out if you want to and uh, see how it affects uh, you next question do glasses or contact lenses allow good uv rays to get into my eyes or do they block them so uh, you do want to get natural sunlight into your eyes you don't want to look into the sun because that's going to burn your eyes and cause cataracts so you do want to be outside and have the blue sky reflect the sunlight into your eyes so you never looked direct never look directly into the sun or do eye gazing or sun gazing or something like that but just be outside when the sun is out that's going to be very beneficial for your eyes and uh, it can help with the circadian rhythm alignment it can help with mood energy production sleep quality antioxidant defense and uh, many other things so uh, glasses and uh, contact lenses unfortunately you're gonna get mostly the blue light <laughs> from there so uh, having contact lenses and walking outside it does filter out the red and amber light amber wavelengths of light uh, from the sun so you're getting mostly the blue light so that can help with like wakefulness and dopamine and uh, things like that but uh, getting blue light in isolation is not uh, that healthy because you're getting this uh, very stimulatory blue light that in excess can pretty much uh, increase oxidative stress and cause mitochondrial damage so like for example this this uh, blue uh, ring light here i'm getting only blue light into my eyes and that technically causes oxidative stress to the mitochondria in my eyes and damages my skin and <laughs> causes wrinkles and those kind of things you know i'm doing it only for 30 minutes or so so it doesn't really matter that much but um, yeah if you were to wear contact lenses you're getting this pretty much the same effect or a very similar effect because you're filtering out the red wavelengths of light uh, through through the glass so ideally you want to not wear glasses i mean with glasses you know the sunlight is going to come through the sides so it just reflects everywhere and just goes through it anyway but with contact lenses uh, unfortunately i do think that it does filter out the red light uh, so ideally you want to remove the contact lenses at least for you know at least 10 to 15 minutes in the morning and uh, maybe in the evening if the sun is setting and you're getting this red light from the sunset which is very healthy for your circadian rhythm and melatonin production and those kind of things so in that scenario you also want to kind of remove maybe the contact lenses and let the natural red light into your eyeballs which is actually very healthy next question how do i lower cortisol so this is an interesting question so people associate cortisol with stress and that's bad cortisol as a hormone is essential it's actually very healthy especially in the morning after you wake up so you want to have a pre pretty r big rise or a spike if you will in cortisol after waking up because uh, it means that your circadian rhythms are working properly it also going to increase your energy your wakefulness your fat burning and synchronizes your circadian clock system if you don't get the cortisol spike in the morning then you're actually going to be very tired and you know you're gonna want to have a cup of coffee to get this artificial spike in cortisol so having the spike in cortisol in the morning is one of the healthiest things for your circadian rhythm and energy uh, energy levels the problem is that if you have too much cortisol either measured in your blood work or if you're just having too much cortisol at the wrong time of the day then that can cause issues so for example cortisol in the evening that's not that is not a good thing for a sleep because you're going to be wired up and anxious and not able to fall asleep and uh, likewise maybe throughout the day if you're having too much caffeine or if, or if you're too stressed out from work or you're in a traffic jam or a car accident whatever then yeah your cortisol levels are going to also rise one uh, key way to like let's say minimize the misalignment of your cortisol production so making sure that you don't have too much cortisol in the evening is to make sure that you synchronize your circadian rhythms properly so that means getting up in the morning getting exposed to natural sunlight maybe moving around doing a cold shower everything to get a good spike in your cortisol levels to uh, have a like a you know starting point for your circadian rhythms anchor your circadian rhythms in the morning with the circadian aligning activities like sunlight movement cold exposure 
as e even like caffeine in the morning can also help to realign your circadian rhythms and uh, realign the cortisol pattern. So if you're changing time zones, having caffeine in the morning time of the new time zone helps to you helps your body to readjust to the new time zone uh, better. So caffeine is a, actually a very useful tool for realigning the circadian rhythms. And in the evening, you also want to kind of do the opposite or, you know, wind down, block the blue light, maybe take melatonin if you're in a new time zone and that higher melatonin production then warrants higher cortisol production in the morning by realigning your circadian rhythms. So on both ends, morning, high cortisol, evening, high melatonin and low cortisol. Is that's, that's the natural circadian rhythm. Other activities to actually lower cortisol, you know, directly during the day can be, you know, meditation has been consistently shown to do that, different breathing exercises, nature bathing, walking in nature, that has been shown to uh, lower cortisol and stress hormones and uh, inc have like um, beneficial effects on the immune system even in a sh very short time. Just going for a walk in nature, in a park or in the forest, very powerful way to lower cortisol and uh, lower stress. Meditation, like I said, and maybe from some supplements, then, uh, you know, sometimes you can be stressed out and you can have high cortisol because you're fasting too much or exercising too much or being in a calorie deficit too much or being on a low carb diet too much. So just eating more or eating something that, you know, helps to lower the cortisol like protein and carbohydrates are actually very powerful ways to lower cortisol as well. So like if you eat carbs in the evening, you're going to get this nice small crash. You're going to increase serotonin, makes you more relaxed. That serotonin converts into melatonin and helps you to fall asleep and helps you to be relaxed. So it's the serotonin from the carbohydrates is very, very easy and very powerful to lower cortisol and help with sleep as well. And lastly, maybe some supplements like ashwagandha has been shown to lower cortisol as well, but uh, it might have some like other negative side effects like excess herbs, so different kinds of adaptogens, uh, the ones that may help to cope with stress in some ways, the adaptogens, they can also be harmful for your liver in high amounts. So these herbal supplements, I wouldn't take them uh, in large doses on a regular basis because, yeah, they have been shown to cause some liver uh, damage as well. All right, that's it for this Q&A. If you want to ask me a question, then make sure you follow me on Instagram at Seamlund. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure you click the like, subscribe, notification bell as well. My name is Seam. Stay optimized, stay empowered.